So welcome back to the Ethics Law and Society Forum. As you know, uh, we feature uh, people from a variety of venues from around the area, around the world. Um, we feature students from SSU. And one of the goals for us is to feature faculty from SSU. And that's what we are doing today. Uh, so Professor Jeff Baldwin is a member of the Geography and Global Studies Department here at Sonoma State University. Uh, he works in a variety of topics related to our relationship with the environment, tourism, and the global economy. Um, and he's wisely specialized in topics that allow him to travel for work to like the West Indies and Oregon, other exotic <laughs> locations. Um, and his ongoing investigation of the human relationship with food is what brings him here today. Uh, his talk is entitled, What Ought I Eat? Food, Our Biosphere, and You. Please join me in welcoming Jeff Baldwin. Hi, thanks for being here. I had sabbatical last uh, fall and I got to go to Cuba um, on a group that was looking at agroecology, right? So how to grow food without chemicals. And so this is one of my passions now. Um, but let's talk about ethics specifically, because that's what the seminar is about. No law today, just ethics. Um, we have ethics about what we ought to eat, right? We have ethics about eating in ways that are healthy for us. And there's a lot of books about this. And there's a lot of blogs about this. And Michael Pollan's been right at the forefront of, hmm, what should I eat if I'm going to be um, eating things that are good for me, right? So he came up with this book called Food Rules for his kind of idiot's guide on what to eat, what not to eat. So avoid food you see advertised on TV. Okay, that's number 11. Number 19, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't eat it, right? And these are kind of fun, too. He's a very witty man. Um, don't eat breakfast cereals to change the color of the milk. Oh, someone said, oh. <laughs> because fruit doesn't actually do that. Um, and then eat all the junk food you want as long as you cook it yourself, right? So go ahead and pick it on popcorn, but you, you make the popcorn. Um, the problem is that um, with a focus on one's health, this doesn't really say anything about our environment, right? And as a human environment geographer, that's what I'm all about, is taking care of our environment, having a healthy environment. So there's all kinds of ways that you can eat healthy in ways that are not sustainable, right? And by sustainability here, what I'm after is this idea of equity and environment and economy, right? So in terms of equity, I'm sure you know that, well, I don't know, how many of you, when you graduate, you want to uh, work in agricultural fields, actually picking vegetables, strawberries, no hands are going up. Is that a surprise? Why? Because these people really aren't paid enough to live, really not paid enough to live, right? So this violates equity at the very least. There's some other issues of farming like this too we could talk about. Okay, what if I eat organic, right? So I'm going to care about chemicals in the environment and I also want to be healthier for me. So this kind of gets me just out of myself, although it is about protecting me from chemicals, but maybe I'm concerned about protecting the environment from chemicals. But if you read this lovely book by Julie Gutman about um, organic farming in California, what you find out is that organic farming in California has been appropriated by agro-industry. And it's quite easy to use all kinds of chemicals and still call yourself organic. Right? So really in California the term organic, well, it means it's not GMO. And it means it's probably using fewer chemicals than they might. But other than that, that's what it means. And then there's this, right? Um, you know what Trader Joe's is? Yeah, okay. And you can go to Trader Joe's and for a lot of you, you can buy organic tomatoes there. And those organic tomatoes can be grown in Baja, California. Now, they may be paying a living wage there, I'm not sure. Does it rain a lot in Baja, California? No, it doesn't. It's a freaking desert, right? Where do they get the water for the tomatoes? It's from an aquifer, and that water is from the Pleistocene. That water is 12,000 years old because there's no more water coming in, and what they're doing is tapping the entire water supply for Baja, California to grow organic tomatoes for you. Is this good for our environment? Right? This is, this is thinking systemically. What are the implications of what I eat here? Okay, I'll eat vegan. Okay, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna hurt anything. And what vegan is about is and vegetarianism is probably I don't want to cause suffering. Right? So I'm gonna eat in a way that doesn't cause animals pain. So what are the problems with this? Well, you can grow vegan food in all kinds of ways that are really problematic for our environment. For example, vegan food may well be treated with atrazine. Atrazine is a widely used broad spectrum, pesticide, insecticide. In 2007, on our corn crop in the United States, we used 62 million pounds of atrazine. 62 million pounds of atrazine. 
Now, it doesn't affect us in California very much, okay, but if you care about the people in the Midwest, there it is. Now, is atrazine safe? Well, of course it is, because the chemical manufacturer tested it. They took a frog, well, a bunch of frogs actually, and they put them in water with some atrazine, and what they got was a frog. No problem, right? This is not systemic thinking, because this was done in a laboratory. What if you took that atrazine and exposed it to deadly UV radiation? Now, how would atrazine ever be exposed to deadly UV radiation in a farm field? Okay, this is sunshine. Just exposed to sunshine, and what happens to the frog? This happens to the frog. The atrazine does not cause the birth defect. The atrazine weakens the immune system so that a nematode is able to invade the developing froglet, and then we get this genetic defect, right? And this has actually become sort of common. Amphibians are great for testing viability of pesticides because the stuff goes right through their skin, right? So they're very open to the environment. So this is systemic thinking. Incidentally, these kinds of defects are eugenic <coughs> defects. These actually are inheritable. So the next generation will also be missing the stuff it needs to keep the nematodes out and so on and so on and so on, right? So as a geographer, we like to think about scales. What if we change the scale of our caring? Not about myself, not about chemicals around me, not about causing suffering. What if we think about our biosphere? And our biosphere is this thin envelope of life that surrounds our world, right? That thin goes down a few miles into the ocean, goes up in the sky a few miles, but that's all we've got, right? That's our biosphere. And we're connected through our biosphere. What if we think about what has life done for the last four billion years? Why don't we pay attention to what life does? Well, what does life do? What's the first law of evolution? Who do you think of when I say evolution? Darwin, okay. And what did Darwin say about evolution? The strongest, the strongest survive, survival of the fittest. What we're going to have is competition, right? This is, this is Darwin's law. Actually, Darwin did not say survival of the fittest. That was Wallace, but okay, they're contemporaries. <laughs> they were kind of frenemies, actually. Interesting group. Um, so this is, this is how we think of evolution, right? Survival of the fittest through competition. Um, what science do we turn to if we want to understand ecological relationships? And it's right there. Ecology, thank you, yeah, <laughs> we turn to ecology, right? How does ecology generally understand relationships between species, animals, plants? Well, through this trophic chain, this idea that we have primary producers, plants, which move <laughs> sunlight and water into bodies that have nutrients that are then eaten by primary consumers, which are eaten by secondary consumers, which are eaten by top predators. It takes about 10 pounds of this to make one pound of this. It takes about 100 pounds, 10 pounds, 1 pound, 1,000 pounds, 100 pounds, 10 pounds, 1 pound, right? So an owl, a pound of owl, is actually represents about 1,000 pounds of primary production. And that's a short-lived owl. Right? <coughs> Think about all the food, the, the, the weight of the food you've eaten in your life, and how big this pyramid would be for you, because you're going to live. And think about how big it's going to be by the time you're 90 years old, right? No. That's how much of the environment you, you eat. Okay, so we get this idea. This is how our biosphere works. Competition, survival of the fittest. You've seen films about animals, right? Right. And what films about animals usually show is predation. Because it's sexy, it's cool. <laughs> right? <laughs> and then we get a little more sexy. We go, ooh, let's get jiggy, okay? And let's have babies, and let's go kill something again. And let's get jiggy. And that's our vision of what our ecosystem is like. And this is such an impoverished way to think about our ecosystem. Because this is not descriptive of what really happens in our biosphere. This does not describe it. And, and I'm calling ecology out here, although they're trying to reform themselves. Think about this. Okay, here's a willow tree. What is it killing? <laughs> oh, is it having sex with anybody? Oh. Boring. Boring, boring film, boring film. But this is life, right? This is life. Remember that for every one primary consumer, there are 100 or 10 to 100 primary producers, right? This is life. This is life. And what does this tree do? Well, let's see. It lives in a riparian area, which means it's by a stream. It has its own trajectory, right? And Val Plumwood writes beautifully about this, about non-humans having trajectories, about having intent in a sense, right? Not that they think about it, but boy, they do things. And we're learning also that plants learn, and they remember, and they communicate with each other, and yeah, have fairly rich life, it turns out. Okay, 
So they grow roots towards water, not away from water. They actually remember where the water is. Plants can do that. They have memories. It turns out there's a whole scientific journal now called Plant Behavior. It's been in publication for about 10 years. Plant Behavior. Um, it produces nutrients. It also produces value for other things. It fixes nitrogen in the soil, which makes the soil richer. It anchors stream bed banks and plains, so the things that live along the stream, happy about that. It produces cooling shade for salmonids, who really like cool water. Right? It also produces significant biomass for things like munch on the leaves a little bit. Um, it provides living space and cover for birds, insects, reptiles, fish, small mammals. Right? These are the exchanges that typify our biosphere. You know, sure, predators eat things, okay, and we have sex occasionally, okay. But this, this so dominates our biosphere. This exchange dominates our biosphere. So why don't we try modeling this instead of modeling that? Okay. So we can think about exchanges of value in our biosphere. What do I mean by value? Well, I go to Marx for this, and Marx actually goes to somebody else for this, but Marx says that value is that which is useful to life. Right? He gives this from John Law. Value is that which is useful to human life. We took out the human. Right. He wrote this 150 years ago. He didn't know about this yet. Exploitation, according to Irish Young, a Marxist scholar, is about an uneven exchange of value. Right? Exploitation would be I take more value from you than I give to you. That would be exploitative, usually through relationships with power. Right? Exploitation. Cooperation would be we work together, and together we have more value than we would have had separately. Right? We create value. Cooperation. So what I want to do is show you that we focus on this type of ecological relationship, when in fact we should be focusing on this type of ecological relationship, and that our food systems focus on this type of ecological relationship, when in fact our food systems could be focusing on this type of relationship. Okay. So I just want to go through these relationships that are more exploitive and more cooperative, briefly. I'm going to the background on this. So predation. On an individual scale, one organism takes all the value, or at least most of the value, from another organism. Right? Now, the rest of the pack will eat on this thing, and they won't eat it all. There'll be crows and ravens and eagles and other things that will eat it all. So, and the soil bacteria will also eat it. But okay, the deer's dead, right? <laughs> Did the deer get anything out of this? No, no, this is exploitative. <laughs> this is exploitative, right? Um, that's on the scale of individuals. On the scale of populations, we have exploitative relationships in invasive species. You've heard of invasive species? This is a species that moves into an area, and for some reason, they're able to extract almost all of the value in that area. Right? So we have pine bark beetles moving across the western portion of North America, way up into British Columbia. And pine bark beetles, they're tiny. They're like that big. And, they, they, and there's a couple other bark beetles, too. They go into the cambrium of the tree, and that's what they eat, because that's, you know, that's where the, the sap runs. That's where all the nutrients are. So, yum, yum, yum. Okay? How does a tree defend itself against a bark beetle? Can it shake out the bark beetles? Can trees do that? No, they can't. How can a tree defend itself? Because they can. Trees are really smart. What would they do? Chemicals. Could be chemicals. In this case, it's not. But some trees do produce chemicals that are really good at this. They produce more sap. They just produce more sap. I got beetles in my cambrium. I'm going to flush them out with sap. I'm just going to produce a lot of that. Flush them out of there. Snap. What if it doesn't rain? What if it doesn't snow? Can I produce as much sap? This is what's happening. We have drying across the western portion of North America. Pine bark beetles no longer are able to be pushed out by sap. Trees are dying. Right? And we're talking about tens of millions of trees across the western part of North America. So invasive species, problematic. Something changed allows the species to do what it couldn't do before, lack of sap. OK, parasitism. Do we have parasites? Okay. But you like to watch TV shows about parasites, right? The monsters within me, that kind of thing. Yeah. Parasitism can be about taking all the value of the host organism, right? And in a sense, a communicable disease that kills you, HIV, AIDS, in a sense, is a parasitic relationship because it is taking all the value from you. You're not getting anything from that. You get a cold, you get anything from the cold? No, but all those little organisms, they get lots from you. But it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, what we find is the longer hosts hang out with parasites, the less exploitative the relationship becomes. Case in point, we have mussels here. Right? And mussels want to spread their little young seeds around. They don't want them growing right next to them because they can crowd them out, right? So how do we get 
if I can't swim, how do I get my offspring away from me? Well, I put out this little lure right here that fish like, and they come and kind of check it out, and that's where my eggs are. It's out there on this little lure that the fish are hanging out with. The lure draws a fish, the little eggs, these guys, go into the gills of the fish, and they get lots of circulation, lots of nutrients coming by. They grow up, and then they release. This is them living in the gills. It doesn't really hurt the fish. The fish has evolved to kind of tolerate this. Because some of the fish can do so. Are you okay? Okay. I sense in your eyes for a while. <laughs> okay. All right. Good. Thanks. Okay. So that makes sense? Parasites don't always cause damage. Right? Now, they get value, but not really necessarily extracting a lot of value from their hosts. Hosts adapt. Hosts adapt. Right? Commensalism is uh, a little less exploitative, right? So a good example of commensalism is this. You find value where nothing else has found value. You turn waste into value. And this is freaking magic, right? This is magic. I find something that has no value whatsoever, and I adapt to make value out of that. Life does this. It creates value out of nothing. It creates value out of waste, right? Example, about 3.5 billion years ago, these organisms evolved to start doing photosynthesis. In that process, they also use CO2. Right? And if we go back 3.5 billion years ago, there was a lot more CO2 in our biosphere. The Earth was warmer because of that. And then the waste product is oxygen. Right? And if we go back 3.5 billion years ago, there wasn't very much oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere. The oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere is because of plants. Plants. <laughs> is oxygen a problem for life? Well, it's really important for life, but it also causes oxidization. And oxidization is another word for burning. Our tissues have to adapt to live with oxygen because it is very corrosive stuff. It likes to bond to all kinds of things. And when it bonds to those, it tends to tear those things up unless you're adapted to it. Right? So animal life had to adapt to use this waste product, and then it had to have a reliable source of it. But we turn waste into value. That's what life does. Waste into value. Facilitation, where one uh, species depends on another species. So uh, this isn't just about us big brained monkeys and dolphins and whales and cute <coughs> fun. This is about bacteria, right? So this isn't an uh, oh, amoebas. This is an amoeba, and this actually isn't one amoeba. This is a whole colony of amoeba. Did you know that amoebas could form bodies? I mean, this is millions of amoebas, and they're all getting together and they're forming this body because it's time to fruit. Because we're running out of food and we've got to disperse ourselves. Do they talk to each other? Maybe. We haven't figured out how to understand them. Right? And, and it's so interesting because we think, oh, we're the only things that talk to each other. And in fact, we're the only things that are so stupid we can't figure out how other things talk to each other. The other things do talk to each other, right? I've got time for this. In Eastern Colorado, they grow potatoes. Lots of potatoes, right? Is that where potatoes are from? Did we know where potatoes first started? Not Ireland. The Andes. The Andes. That's where potatoes were first grown. If you go to the Andes today, people now have identified about 950 different varieties of potatoes that people grow there. Right? And the way this happens is, um, well, I'm growing some potatoes, and, oh, I have some land over here that I'm not using, but it's kind of wet. My potatoes aren't really wet adapted. So I'm going to put a few in there and see how they do. And well, one of the plants does kind of OK. So what I do is I save the seeds from that plant, and I plant those seeds in that wet stuff pot again. And the next year, well, a couple of seeds are even better. A couple of plants are even better. So I'm going to save those seeds. I just keep planting the seeds that do well in the same soil, and pretty soon I get some wet adapted potatoes. Right? So of these 950 varieties of potatoes, we don't know how many humans actually created through this process, through selective breeding over 7,000 years, but a lot, a lot. Right? Potatoes have not been growing in eastern Colorado for very long, maybe 100 years. Okay. Now there's this beetle, this little tiny beetle that loves to eat potatoes. Right? Now it's, not, it's from Colorado, and so it's not adapted to potatoes. It, that's not what it lived with. But now it comes there and it goes, oh, it's just like this thing I used to eat. And it goes nuts, because insects used to be really, really specific about what they eat. They love to eat potatoes, okay? The leaves. So when the potatoes come under attack, what they do is they release a pheromone, a little chemical signal, that tells the other potatoes, gird your loins, we're under attack. 
Bring new starches down into the core here. Let them eat the leaves. We'll save our energy that way we can grow new leaves after they're all gone. Okay? So the potatoes talk to each other and they respond appropriately. This is communication. There's a spider that lives in this part of the world that loves to eat those beetles. That's what it does. It eats those beetles. These spiders have learned to read that pheromone. They smell the potato distress pheromone. They go, oh, lunch. And they go and eat the, the beetles. Species talking with each other. Is there another species we can talk to with our big freaking brains? <laughs> with our big freaking brains? Try to give credit to non-humans, right? As much as I can, because they're amazing. They're amazing. We can learn. Mutualism is when two different groups or three or four different groups get together and they work together to have more than they had before. So we have mutual benefit, right? Mutualism. So lots and lots of examples of this. <laughs> Insect world, plant world. In this case, we've got mutualism in the American Southwest where these acacia trees tolerate these caterpillars. Right? The caterpillars like the, the, the blossoms of the acacias. Um, the acacias, it's okay. It, you know, they do better without it, but it's okay. We can live with it. These caterpillars have these nectar organs over here on each side, and they produce nectar. And it turns out these ants really like to eat this nectar. Right? So they don't kill the caterpillar, they just basically eat the nectar the plants are producing. And what the ants do is they provide protection both from the plant and the caterpillar for things that might climb up the tree trunk and really go nuts on the acacia blooms or on the caterpillars. The ants protect the tree. So we have three species working together, and they're all richer for the, the mutual being of each other. Right? Mutualism. mutualism. Um, we've got lots of other species that do this. Corals, and the algae that lives with corals, for example. Right, neither can live without the other. Completely mutualistic. Um, we have mutualistic communities that don't involve humans. So, for example, if we go to a wetland area, warmish, I, I, I did this while I was working on the Mississippi paper. Um, we have estuary wetlands. We love estuary wetlands because what happens there is sort of amazing. They produce a tremendous amount of biomass. They sequester a tremendous amount of carbon. Although it doesn't look like it. You don't see any big trees here, right? It looks sort of non uneventful. Well, that's because a lot of life doesn't stay here. Right? This is where about a quarter of the fish that we eat spend their young lives. And the other things that these estuaries do is, well, first of all, they help filter pollutants that are coming through the estuary. They help filter out nutrients that are coming through the estuary, which can be a problem if we get too much nutrient out in the ocean out here, because then the plankton go nuts, they die, bacteria eat it, they suck up all the oxygen, we get no water, no oxygen in the water, right? Estuaries help with that. They also, because we get a tidal flush of salt water every day, get all these nutrients from the ocean coming in. So there's nutrients from both directions here. So if you can adapt to salt water and fresh water, that's bad. Right? There's so much here to eat, you can hardly keep up with it. So we get all this production here. And what these things do is they filter that water. The water comes out here to the near shore environment, the salt environment. And because there's not too much sediment, which gets trapped up here, and there's just some nutrient, well, the sea grasses love that. That's perfect for them. Right? No sediment, some nutrients. Yes. Healthy, 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 healthy happy seagrass. The seagrass beds absorb waves. It's kind of hard to understand that this little thing like this in the water could absorb a wave, but when you talk about several hundred feet of those that a wave has to go through, you know, it comes in and starts dragging on that. It's sort of like trying to run in jello, right? It's, it's going to slow you down eventually. So what we get, by the time these waves get to the shore, it's nice gentle waves. They're not erosive waves, they're depositional waves. They're bringing sediment into the estuary. And so what we get is a nice, healthy estuary with growing barrier islands. What if we disrupt this? What if we stop the nutrient and sediment flows going into the estuaries? What if we start cutting canals through the estuaries? What if we allow nutrients to go out and take out the seagrasses? This becomes an erosive environment, right? This is the Mississippi Delta. This is what we've done to the Mississippi Delta. The Mississippi Delta is disappearing. It is vanishing. You heard about Katrina? One of the reasons Katrina got into New Orleans was because and this is largely building big dams upstream and then using, um, taking, digging canals for uh, petroleum and, and gas lines through the delta. And that's pretty much fragmented the delta is coming apart, right? This whole ecosystem is coming apart. 
But what you see here is undisturbed. We've got different communities that are all mutually dependent on each other. They're all helping each other out. We have mutualism between non-human communities. Why couldn't we do that? Okay. So, take home is this. Life imbues environments with value. Right? Life co-evolves. It adapts to find value in the waste of other things. This is what life does. What do we do? How do we produce our food? Well, this is how commercial agriculture works. You kill everything, everything that you possibly can, and then you plant one thing. This is called monocropping. If I am a bug that likes to eat this, I'm so happy, right? Because you just set 10, 50, 100, 1,000 acres of beets, and what I do is eat beets. Yes! Right? Now, where in the natural world would you ever find 1,000 acres of nothing but beets? Right? It doesn't happen in the natural world. In the natural world, you get all kinds of variety. It doesn't happen. So, that's problematic. This is also problematic because these plants are probably green revolution plants, and green revolution plants, they produce much more food per plant. Through the Green Revolution, globally, we increased food supply 300% between 1950 and the year 2000. Tremendous increase in food production, but it's incredibly thirsty. These plants suck up a tremendous amount of water. Are we starting to have issues with water shortages? Yes? This is not just a California thing. This is a global thing, right? Too much water is being sucked up here, so that's problematic also. We've got all these insects. How do we get rid of the insects? Atrazine, good, okay, pesticides, right? Oh, and to make them grow this well, we have to put lots of fertilizer on here, which is maybe okay, but a lot of this fertilizer is nitrogen fertilizer, and nitrous oxide is a major greenhouse gas, so when we put nitrous, nitrogen fertilizer on here, we're creating greenhouse gas, and these plants tend to take up 5 to 10% of the fertilizer we put on the field. What happens to the rest of the fertilizer? It goes into the little rivers, it goes to the ocean, it feeds those plankton blooms, the bacteria eat the plankton, the bacteria die, other bacteria eat the, that bacteria, they suck up all the oxygen in the water, and we get hypoxic oxygen dead zones off the coast. Right? Our shrimp fisheries start to collapse, our crab fisheries start to collapse because we're going through this way. We're invasive. Right? This is invasiveness. This is invasiveness. <coughs> There's no mutual benefit going on here. There's one thing, it is for us, and we exclude the all benefit, everybody else, the farmer tries to incorporate that. Have you noticed when you go to a grower's market, food costs more than Safeway? Yes? Yes. I mean, it's very nice. The people are there, and the food looks lovely. But it really, I mean, these apples are probably 3 dollars a pound, right? 4 dollars pounds, pound, something like that. It costs more. It costs more. You've noticed this? Yeah, OK. All right, great. Um, that's how much food costs. That's how much it would cost. If, if you pay workers enough to live, that's how much it would cost. If you make soils that are lively and produce nutrients, where does good soil come from anyway? Do you know? What, what, what makes good soil? Compost? Who said compost? Yes, 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 compost. <laughs> good soil is bug poop. That's what good soil is. It's insect and bug poop. That's in, in bacterial poop. That's what it is. It's the decomposition of formerly living matter into nutrients that are available for plants. It is bug poop, right? It is worm castings. Yes, that's how you make good soil. Um, and if you pay farmers enough to stay in business, right? This is how much food costs. This is how much it costs. Hmm. Can you afford that? <laughs> now, you're students, I understand. Maybe you can't afford that. <laughs> But hopefully, after you're not students anymore, you will be able to afford that because of this. Look at this. This is um, 19, 9, 1900, 1950, 2003. Right? 1900, 1950, 2003. This is how much the average American household spent on food in 1900. Almost half the budget. In 1950, it's about a third of the budget. Now it's about 13% of our budget. That's how much the average American household spends on food. 13% of the household budget. 13%. And the average American household, if they're sort of middle income, spends uh, about half of that, a little more than half of that, on food at home. A lot of this is spent at restaurants, right, eating out, which is expensive, right? I mean, the food that actually goes to the restaurant. And you're not buying whole foods. You're not buying celery sticks here. You're buying the stuff that's processed, right? You're buying 
What did you have for breakfast this morning? Just think about that. <coughs> was there a fruit that has not been processed by somebody in your breakfast? Some of you are going, yeah, some of you are going, no. Was there a grain that was not processed? Have you even seen a grain? Have you ever seen wheat that has not been processed? Or rye? Do you know what rye looks like? Right? In that box of grape nuts or whatever you're eating, the food, the actual food that goes into that usually costs about two or three percent of the actual cost of the thing. Right? The rest of the cost is processing, shipping, transportation, marketing. The grocery store takes a bit and profit for the producers, right? So we're not really spending that much on food. So could we afford to buy this stuff if we sort of re-evaluated our priorities? And I would argue, yeah, most people could. Student income? I don't blame you. <laughs> buy, buy this cheap stuff? I understand. <laughs> I understand. <coughs> but once you get out of here, this is going to be you. Why does this matter? Well, we're um, running out of water. And as the earth warms, we get more evaporation, which is going to put even more pressure on water. As the earth warms, we're getting less and less snowfall in mountain ranges, which means we have less summer water. Almost a third of the water we use in California is from snow melt. You know what happened last year? We didn't get any snow? Not much snow melt, not much water for us, right? Snow is turning to rain across the world because our winters are not as cold as they used to be, right? Falls as rain, runs off, it's not there for the summer for us anymore. Unless we let beavers go back to our streams, which is my other research project. <laughs> We are injecting a lot of pesticide, which is making us sick. Right? We are increasing soil erosion and soil degradation, and this is what this looks like. If it is red, and this is 1997, this is almost 20 years ago. It has not gotten better, folks. If it is red, it means the soil is very degraded. When you plow that soil over right, and turn it over, you expose it to wind erosion, you expose it to rain erosion, you expose it to all kinds of erosion. It washes away. Thousands and thousands and thousands of tons of soil a year. We're losing, we're losing, we're losing. And if you look at the United States, well, okay, Pacific Northwest <coughs> is good. That's Morgan. Yeah, 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 okay. Stay with us. But boy, every place else except for Florida in the U.S., we're losing the soil. We're losing it, right? Commercial agriculture is doing this. It's not working for us. In the U.S., we can see what causes this more specifically. In North America, 30% of soil erosion is through overgrazing. Six of it is through agriculture. Right? It's just not taking care of our soils, allowing it to erode. Other types of degradation occur too. And then there's this. This is species extinction and threatened. So red is extinct, um, yellow is critically threatened or endangered. Species by world region. Right? And a lot of this is because we have destroyed habitat. We've taken away habitat because we're farming it now. Right? We keep expanding our, our footprint of farming. And we farm in a way that doesn't allow other things to live there. So, you can get eggs from chickens that are grown like this in very small cages. In California, we have a law that is going to affect soon that's going to give chickens about 18 inches to live in, right? Right now, they have about 9 inches. They spend their life in 9 inches. And these are hens, not, not food chickens. So they can live 3 4 years producing eggs in this 9-inch cage. Uh, we have to burn off the top of their bills so they don't peck each other or themselves to death. They cannot stand up. But you can eat an egg and not hurt anything or cause suffering, right? Because you're not killing anything? Vegan eggs? Yeah. Or vegetarian eggs? Yeah. But you're causing suffering. Right? Or you could eat pesticide. These are chickens. This is corn. What the chickens do is they go to the cornfield and eat the bugs that trouble the corn. And then the chickens go back to the roost and make eggs. The corn's happier. The chickens are happier, we get happy eggs, and we get fewer bugs without pesticide. Right? This is grass fed, this is commercial. That's the kind of choice you can make. Do I want cage free, grass fed, free range chickens, or do I want something else? I'm just going to show you this quickly. I didn't know if I had time, I've got another minute. This another way to grow food is through agroecology. And agroecology means doing things like this. We're going to mix trees in with our crops. And this is cool because if we have a windstorm, studies show that the trees take a lot of the energy out of the storm and our crops aren't damaged by this. Not only that, but some trees produce things that kind of scare away animals and plants and weeds and other insects. Why do coffee trees make caffeine? 
I'm really glad they do. I'm really glad they do. But why do they make caffeine? Why do coffee trees do that? Tea trees do that too, caffeine. And tobacco makes nicotine, right? Which I used to be really glad they did, but I haven't done that for about 20 years. <laughs> um, and then co coca trees make the thing we make cocaine out of. I don't forget what you call that now, right? They make it like that. Why do they make this stuff? They are pest discouragers. They are pest discouragers. Now, pesticides is something that kills pests. It kills them. It kills 99.9% .9 of them. But amongst that population of insects, there's going to be that one, that population of fungi, there's going to be that one, that population of bacteria, there's going to be that one that has a genetic variation that makes it so it's not killed by that thing. Who has babies this year? The one that's not killed. What do we have next year? A whole bunch of insects, fungi, and bacteria that are not susceptible to your pesticide. Roundup is losing its efficacy today. We have over eight different weed species in some states that are no longer affected by Roundup because we kept spraying them, and the ones that were tough enough to survive it, they survived, and that's who had babies. Right? Caffeine gives a caterpillar a tummy ache. Oh, I don't feel good. I'm going to crawl over here and eat this thing. Nicotine does the same thing. It doesn't kill. It just destroys. And so there's no genetic selectivity going on here. It's good for hundreds of millions of years because it doesn't kill. It discourages. Right? So, what if we do coffee amongst our mango trees, which they were doing in uh, Cuba? Well, coffee produces this thing that some insects don't like and keeps them off the mango trees. Smart! Can I get coffee and mangoes? Because coffee likes shade. Yes, it all works out. It all works out. And under that, I'm going to do some other stuff too. Agroecology, ag agroforestry. Conservation agriculture, instead of turning over the soil, I'm going to use a seed drill, which actually could have, it's just a very simple mechanism, that instead of turning over the soil, we just drill a little hole, and it's just a puncture. It's not a drill, it's a puncture, and then it drops a seed. It just drops a seed, you leave the vegetative community there, we leave everything in place, no erosion, and we get our crop. Yeah. Simple technology. Almost a third of American agriculture has switched to this now. The farmers say you can't do it until your father dies. Your dad's going to say, what the heck are you doing, that's you. Right? <laughs> because farmers are like that. Okay. Integrated pest management. Integrated pest management. So in, in, uh, in Cuba, they say the greatest pesticide is uh, diversity and helpful insects. So I actually saw a, a, a research institute on helpful insects. And that's what these people were doing. Like, what insects can help us take out this fungi? What insects can help us take out this insect? What insect can help us with this? And so we, we help each other and we learn from each other, and that's how it works in Galpacino, you know, I've in Cuba. People will figure it out and they share it with people, right? Um, horticulture, very small scale agriculture. In other words, we're going to grow for our families, but we're going to grow traditional things, things that are adapted to living in this climate. And there's things we can do with livestock, we can move them around more, right? There's a couple of, of uh, cattle ranches in Marin County that are becoming famous because they are carefully managing where their cows are grazing. And by doing that, they're actually making the soils richer. And because the soils are richer, they hold moisture better, which means they have more grass, which means they have more roots, which means they have more carbon, and happier cows, right? right? So we can do this. So a study in Sub-Saharan Africa, take a look at this, and what they found, now it's not a very big study. They only looked at 12.75 million hectares, right? which is 45,000 square miles. I mean facetious, 45,000 square miles of farmland. And what they found was, oh, 200% increase in productivity. Oh, only 196% here. 220% increase in productivity. These things work. They work. They don't work with great big tractors on thousands and thousands of hectares. They work much better on small plots, but it works. This is a way to have much livelier soil, much <coughs> livelier environment, lots of biodiversity, and food. Food. Agroecology. Some folks in Sebastopol doing this right now. <laughs> Check it out. Um, these are some of the things I've written about this. Uh, I wrote a paper a while back called The Culture of Nature uh, through Mississippian Geographies. I wrote this, uh, published this, I think, three years ago. Um, I titled it What Ought I Eat? That's what the, 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 the proof said. And then I got the journal, I opened it up, and it said, What Ought I to Eat? They changed the title of it. I thought, <laughs> and so I typed the phrase, What Ought I Eat? And spelled check, grammar check, change the title. So they let grammar check change a approved copy title. In any case, there it is. <laughs> ethics in the environment, environment and the ethics, and I have this chapter coming out in the book. 
should be out early next year on life, labor, and values. A little bit more about Marx here in species Corporation. So if you want to know more about what I do, those are some sources. Which leaves us about nine minutes to talk about this stuff. So what can I tell you? What questions do you have? Yeah. Um, so where locally can we find food that's sustainable? So somebody just did a study on uh, local sourcing for food in this part of Sonoma County. Andes was number one. Okay, you know where Andes is? No. It's it's on Highway 116 past Sebastopol. Okay, I would not encourage you to burn that much gas to go to Sebastopol to get some local food, right? Because that's a fool's errand, right? You're just putting more carbon in the air. No, don't want to do that. The second best, most local, Oliver's. Oliver's. Oliver's works really hard to find local stuff, and I just love going in Oliver's produce because oh, they have Asian pears there that actually taste good, right? <laughs> and they're not that expensive. They're not quite as expensive as the farmer's market. Some of the organic stuff is, but Oliver's is great for this, and, and you know where it is, right? They did 10 different places. Safeway was number 10, right? But they didn't do Rayleigh's. They didn't do g, &G I don't know. But Oliver's. Oliver's is great. Yeah, yeah. And then there are farmer's markets, right? So you go down Ronald Park Expressway over here. I think it may be done now. They kind of shut down in the wintertime. But for about six months, they have a, a farmer's market there on Friday nights with mu live music and food. <laughs> and then Katati has a farmer's market, I think it's on Wednesday nights, but not in the winter. But, but come spring, watch for it. Katati's got one. You know where the accordion festival is? That little park? That's where that is, yeah. You can go there and then go have some Thai food. Great. Okay. Ride the bus for free. <laughs> so that's, that's where you get local food. Yeah. What else? Uh, uh, hydroponics, which you use the water and then it feeds the plants and then you have bacteria. <coughs> what, are, what are your opinions on that? Do you think it's sustainable? Aquaponics. Uh, hydro and aquaponics. Aquaponics, yeah. So aquaculture is you grow fish, you farm fish, right? And um, there are fish like tilapia <coughs> that will eat almost anything. They're great at turning waste in, in, into value, right? They will eat farm waste. They will actually eat poop. Tilapia will eat almost anything, right? You've had tilapia? This may turn you off to it now. <laughs> um, a lot of it is from China. I don't buy food from China because they don't have, they're not careful with chemicals in their food. But you can get a rare food in tilapia. Last time I was in Peru, I'm in Ecuador. Boy, when we were in the mountains, we just kept passing these ponds, and what they were growing there was tilapia, and every restaurant had tilapia on the menu, right? So this is aquaculture. About half of the seafood we eat today is grown, is farmed. It's not caught anymore. Half, because we're stretching limits of what we can catch here. Hydroponics is a way to grow f vegetables, f well, vegetables, not fruit, without soil, right? And so you grow them in water, and you just really intensively, like on a rooftop on a skyscraper in Manhattan or something where you don't have soil. And um, you need to put nutrients into the water that the plants need, the plants grow. Great, right? Somebody figured out, hey, why don't I put the two together? Aquaponics. So the fish poop, which is nutrient, give that to the plants, the plants take that out, off they go. I take the waste from the plants, you know, the stems and things, I cut off those up and I feed them to the fish, which makes poop, that feeds the plant, and I get fish and produce. Yeah. And I've only seen small scale operations like this, but they, they, they seem to kind of work. I don't know if it's the future or not, but they seem to kind of work. Yeah. And where I've seen this is in Antigua, in Jamaica, and in Cuba. Not, not in the United States. This is more of the developing world thing, it seems. Yeah. What else? Yeah? Um, so all this stuff you described sounds really amazing, so why don't farmers do it? Is it like a cost expense that's oh my goodness. off? Or? Take one of my classes. Take two or six. <laughs> it's a really big question. Um, discourse. Farmers are told this is what you do. And the agro Agribusiness companies, Monsanto, Archer Daniel Midland, has worked very hard <coughs> to endumbin farmers, make them stupid. Knowledge in farming comes from the corporations because they're the ones who are designing the seeds and the farmers don't know these seeds. They don't know how to farm these seeds. And so they've got to go to CalGen or Monsanto to even see how to do this. And then I have to buy their chemicals, including their pesticides, to make them grow. And more and more, I'm becoming a contract farmer where I don't really even own the seeds anymore. I'm more leasing the seeds, and I have to pay them back. And if I can't pay them back all, I'm really screwed, right? And it's hard to upscale this. It's hard to mechanize this. This is about using labor a lot. This is the parts of the world where we have lots of labor in the rural areas. 
works better. If you have a farm that's working, a lot of American farmers have one, two, three thousand acres that they farm with very little help other than machines. It's a big switch, right? A big switch. But we're getting more people your age that are starting to get interested in agriculture. And that's what we're seeing, is that new farmers in the United States are much more likely to use kind of thing than established farmers. Established farmers, it's hard to change that culture. It's hard to get out of that discourse. Of, this is what I'm supposed to do. But again, there's these two young men um, over by Freestone, that side of Sebastopol, graduates of Santa Cruz University, UC. They're horse farmers. They're using machines. They got a couple of horses. That's how they, that's how they work the land. And it's just pretty much them and a couple of friends. Yeah. So that's happening more and more. It's going to take a while, but it's happening. Um, would you say that permaculture is also part of the agroecology? Permaculture is sort of like ag agroecology on steroids. Uh -huh. In that permaculture, permaculture actually says this is how you should arrange everything. I mean, there's this whole landscape that they go through. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it works. It works. But it is, it is, agro it is agroecology. But it is all of those techniques right. and some more. And some more. I heard it's also part of, a lot of it is the way the water just naturally flows down. That's part of it, yeah. Okay. That's very much a part of it. Uh, biodynamics does the same sort of thing, um, uh, except that they take it one step further and they basically treat the land homeo homeopathically. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so it's just one step beyond that. Uh, they do things like plant on certain moon cycles, certain moon phases, and they harvest on certain moon phases. Biodynamics does this. Um, you bury a bull's horn full of chalk under the oak tree at the top of the hill each winter, right? Homeopathic treatment. Um, but I talked to somebody who started a biodynamic winery in, in the Central Coast like eight years ago, and after six years they were already winning awards. So I don't know if it's just because they really focus on caring about it <laughs> or if there's something to it. They make a really good grape and really wine. So permaculture is one step beyond this, biodynamic one step beyond that. Anything else? We've got a couple more minutes. Yeah. Are there like, any notable changes that are being seen in like, the agriculture industry working towards sustainability like, in the United States? If you look at the proportion that is organic, that is increasing at a significant rate, but it's still this much, right? So even 3-4% increase per year, it's, it's that much of the whole pie. Where we're seeing more of this is in developing rural areas, where um, agribusiness has not really that dominant hold over agro uh, over um, agriculture. So there we're seeing it. In Sub-Saharan Africa, we're seeing it. In Sub-Saharan Africa and in the Andes, people are starting to go back to stuff they used to grow, uh, stuff that grows well there, rather than trying to grow what we say they should grow. In Central India, a lot of people are starting to grow millet again. And I don't know, have you had millet? You eat millet a lot? It's not something that Europeans tend to eat. But that's what grows really well in that part of India. And so a bunch of women's groups got together who managed to get a little bit of land and they figured out composting and they started growing millet. And it works. It works. So developing world, happening more. Like, Slowly. Sure, like, our agriculture industry is like, aware of something. Our agriculture industry is doing everything they can to destroy this. Are they just concerned with the industry? This is about making money. The way I make money is by monopolizing the flow of value. In Canada and the United States, a lot of farmers don't even make a profit if they are not subsidized. Right? That's how, how skinny it is to be a farmer here. That's how much power, and again, take one of my classes, that's how much power agro-industry has. The money goes to agro-industry, the money goes to the wholesalers. It goes to Archer Daniels Midland. Have you heard of Archer Daniels Midland? About a quarter to a third, 40% of our corn crop is purchased by Archer Daniels Midland, ADM. They're global. Um, they invented high fructose corn syrup. They also were the biggest voice pushing for ethanol as fuel in our tanks. Because guess what? They buy corn at a very low price, and they want to sell corn at the highest price possible. Right? So this is happening. The wholesalers have a stranglehold on the farmers because they get together and talk about what the farm gate price is going to be. And because they kind of have a monopoly, a monopsy on what they sell, they can negotiate the price up for, for the people who actually buy the stuff to use it to process the food. There's all these power relationships in agriculture that we don't see, but they're, they're there. They're there. Yeah. And they're not going to let go easily. <laughs> got time for one more, maybe? You got it? Yeah? Does the FDA regulate their kinds of pesticides and like, GMOs that are put into place? The way chemical testing works in the United States generally is the manufacturer um, sometimes needs to show whether it's safe or not. Sometimes. 
But in the United States today, we produce about 82,000 chemicals, and about 1,800 of those have been tested for safety. 82,000 chemicals, 1,800 have been tested for safety, about 240 have been shown to be carcinogenic or otherwise toxic, and a small portion of those have actually been taken off the market. Yeah, yeah. Your food, um, we better stop. So thank you for your attention. I'll hang out for a minute.